there's always been this contradiction in our ideas about what caused sexual harassment. On one hand, we think it's holding power. On the other hand, we think it's desire for power. In our research, we found that the greatest risk for sexual misconduct was people who held low power positions, in particular men in those positions. And when they have that desire, that's when we see the sexual harassment come out. They're probably deeply motivated by this desire for power. And then somehow it seems like they've come to identify as the type of person who uses uh, sexuality to get the things that they want. And if they could perhaps change their self-concept or change their intentions to relate to the people in a more connection-oriented way, then we might not see those things. We certainly don't mean to say that it isn't important to attend to these prominent examples of high power men doing these things. Obviously, those are like extremely harmful and deserve attention and scrutiny. But our research shows that typically when you put people in high power positions, they feel more responsible for other people, for protecting them, for guiding them. And so I think there are actually some positive effects of power itself. It just has a lot to do with motives. Anytime we enter a social interaction, we can decide, do we want to connect with this person or do we want to establish a hierarchy with this person? And I think that we see people who want to establish a hierarchy with other people uh, being the, the people who sexually harass others. There is a wide range of sexual misconduct, absolutely, with people exposing themselves at one end. And in our studies, people using sexual in the window and in interviews. Past work has looked at things like sending pornographic images. It does come in a variety of forms, but I think what's common to it is that it tries to demean others. And there just isn't respect in it. In our work, we defined it as behavior that's rated by people as high in dominance and low in form. It's perceived as badly intentioned, and I think that's really where the misunderstanding uh, between some men and women about sexual harassment lies. I think men too often think like, they're scared to spend time with women, especially women they might be attracted to because they think if they show their attraction that they're going to get accused of sexual harassment. And I think women probably largely agree that that's not what is harassment. It has a lot to do with these dominance motives and these intentions to demean a person who's trying to show up as her best self at work and be seen for her competence and her non-sexual qualities. I definitely think organizational culture plays a role in allowing sexual harassment. I think it has a lot to do with how the organization socializes people around power. So does holding power mean that you carry additional responsibility, especially to those below you? Uh, or does it mean that you're kind of free to act as you will internally as long as you achieve these pressing external goals? People in high power roles are certainly under a lot of pressure and so organizations might try to let them off the hook in certain ways when they're producing results, but then that's why we see all of this bad behavior. You know, we really need to think about what our values are and try to institute cultures that value respect for other people and value connection and aren't always about kind of competitive cutthroat competition and measurable results that excuse bad behavior. Sexual misconduct is certainly a hard problem to solve, but I think that looking at our motives and looking at the motives that are inspired by our organizational cultures is a good place to start. So instead of thinking in terms of how do we get more power, thinking about uh, our purpose more, you know, thinking about connecting with our colleagues more, aiming to do meaningful work, I suspect would lead to a culture uh, that would be less conducive to these gender differences in sexually harassing behavior. I also think that it's great that the Me Too movement started to bring out some of these different concepts of masculinity. I think some men are socialized to think in terms of dominance, that being a man means dominating other people and that dominance is the entitlement. And I think that has a lot to do with why men engage in more of these behaviors than women do. But I think there are probably other men who are, in essence, um, 
taught more about benevolent norms. Like it's your duty to be courageous. It's your duty to, you know, stand up for what's right and protect other people. And I think starting to think about what types of masculinity are good for society and what types are toxic is another route that we should go and really think about uh, as we socialize, you know, our sons and uh, brothers and uh, you know classmates and husbands you know to think about what being a man is because there's a lot of meaning like tied up in in gender for men we talk about it a lot for women but it's a, a strong construct for men too